Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, here we are once again, and uh, this is going to be part two, part two of the history of the human race, actually the new history of the human race with Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, PhD in biology from Harvard University, who works at Answers and Genesis in the research department, who's been researching genetics and doing a lot of work in regard to people groups, cultures, uh, the population in, on, on the earth and its history. And he's gonna be rewriting history, uh, not biblical history. He's gonna show that when you rewrite history, it confirms biblical history. Uh, biblical history makes sense of what we see. So today, this is part two, following on from part one, where you sort of gave the introduction. And you're gonna talk about the British, are they really French or are the French British? I got a feeling this could, this could start World War Three or something, but uh, Dr. Jensen, over to you and uh, start with uh, part two here. Share my screen, here we go. Yes, so we're still focused on the big question of who do we come from? And the research I've been doing with my colleagues just in the last few years, has dramatically rewritten this question. This is information you can find only here. It's research that has just been coming out. Some of it's still in progress. We're hoping to put this into book form for release in 2021, which is the 150th anniversary of Darwin's answer to who we come from, namely from ape-like creatures. So the most, most of the focus of our discussion though is gonna be not necessarily on the, the ape human, we'll cover that too, but heavily on the what happened after Babel. We focus a lot on creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion. Tower of Babel in Genesis 10, Genesis 11. Then what? How do we get to the present day? Who do we come from? There's a lot of genetic testing companies out there trying to give you an answer. What you're gonna hear in these sessions is something dramatically different. We'll talk about why the mainstream popular testing companies can't tell you much more than beyond a few generations. So this gets at the whole spectrum of human history. All the way back to the ancients, we're gonna discuss questions like, what happened to the ancient Persians? What happened to the Babylonians? Those who hauled Israel off in captivity, who did they come from? What happened to them? Could, could some of their descendants be Jews? Could some of them, could some of us go back to these kings and, and queens of the ancient days? These are the questions we wanna cover. Last session, we found that the world is smaller than we think. We looked at the history of peoples, the, human, the history of human population growth, and we've seen that we live in a unique era of human history. In the last 600 years, the world population has exploded 20-fold, whereas in the 2,400 years prior, going back to 1,000 BC, it, it grew only about sevenfold. And this has big implications for who people came from and how related our parents are to each other, how related you are to your own spouse, really how related you are to yourself, because you're the product of your, both your parents. What I wanna show you today is that the French are probably British and vice versa. So if you're an American, this may not seem that significant. I learned a, a little bit about this rivalry in history class in high school. I was able to experience firsthand some of the long-term effects of this just a couple of years ago. So summertime of 2018, the World Cup, the once every four years soccer marathon was held in Russia. The World Cup final was on July 15th between France and Croatia. So even though the teams are drawn from around the world, these are the last two teams standing. The US didn't even qualify for that year. And so I had little, really no dog in the fight, though I was kind of leaning towards France. I had emailed one of my uh, friends in England to ask who he was rooting for a few days prior. And again, my thoughts were, well, why not the French? 20 years earlier, the French had been in the finals. Zinedine Zidane was one of their stars. He scored two goals. They, they beat Brazil, I think, three to zero. He was masterful with the ball, a real pleasure to watch, a, a, a wizard. And the 2018 French team was no exception. They had, again, fun players to watch, like Kylian Mbappe. And he played extremely well in the, in the final as well, scored as well. And uh, the Croatian team had reached the final, of course, through the semifinal. Final. Well, who was their opponent in the semifinal? The English side. And they eliminated the English side on an extra time goal. So a tragic end for the English side. And so in light of all this, I asked my colleague who he was rooting for. His, was, his reply was, well, we can't have the French winning, hoping Croatia wins. So despite being eliminated by the Croatian side, the antagonism between the British and the French 
lasted to this present day. My history teacher taught me that even though people of my generation, I was born in 1980, grew up heavily on World War II history, there's all sorts of books and documentaries and stories from that, even though we've grown up with this sense of, well, they're part of the Allied side against Nazi Germany and fascist Italy and, and Japan, US, Great Britain, France, Soviet Union, we were, we were in the fight together. She reminded us that this is an odd exception to a long-standing historical antagonism between the British and the French. So to tell a Frenchman or a Brit that they're closely related might be a cause for great concern. So let's take up that question. How related are the French and the British? Let's take these two gentlemen, two soccer players, Harry Kane there on the right. How related are they? And we can answer this question without knowing anything about their DNA, without knowing anything about their individual family trees. All we have to do is run some numbers. So let's start with this Frenchman. The numbers that apply to him apply to any person. And it comes, the reason we can, we can do these calculations because it comes from biology. Biologically, all of us have two parents. So that's the first section of his family tree. He's got two parents. Well, each of his parents also come from two parents. It's just the law of biology. So he's got four grandparents. And each of those grandparents on the mother's side, the father's side, the maternal grandmother, the maternal grandfather, the paternal grandmother, paternal grandfather, they each come from two parents. So you can see there's a pattern developing here. This, this Frenchman comes from two parents, which come from two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, and on back you go. It doubles every generation. Well, it's easy to get lost in the math, so let's put some calendar years on this to make it easier to track. Let's say this guy was born in 2000, so that would have made him 18 in the World Cup. may not be true, but it makes the math easier. So here's the doubling of the generations, and here's then the calendar years next to it. To keep the math easy to follow, let's say that on average, in each prior generation, the parents gave birth to the next generation when they were 25 years old. So if he was born in 2000 and his parents were 20, 25 years old when he was born, then his parents would have been born 25 years earlier in 1975. And then his grandparents 25 years before that, 1950. Great-grandparents, 1925. Great-great-grandparents, 1900. And on back you go. So with these patterns in hand, we can start to ask questions of how big was his family tree at a certain date in history. So let's go back another 200 years, from 1900 to 1700. This would be the great, 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 so there's, there's nine greats then in this grandparental generation. How many ancestors would he have had? So you just go back, you keep doubling until you get to the year 1700, and he ends up with 2,048 great, 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 great grandparents. So we said he's a Frenchman. Let's compare that to the population size of France in 1970, uh, AD 1700. So at this time in history, we've got Queen Anne ruling over Britain, Louis the Great over France. 1700, of course, if you're thinking about US history, the US isn't even in existence yet. Uh, the, the British in North America are part of the British colonies. And the French are also here, think French Canada, and their competing claims would come to blows 50 years later. But on the European side, there's 22 million people in what we'd call modern France. So his great, 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 great grandparents, nine times great, represent just a small fraction of this total populace. So what? Big deal. Well, let's take it back another 200 years to AD 1500. So this is just eight years after Columbus has discovered the New World. In Great Britain, King James IV is on the throne. France has Louis XII. And we're at the great, 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 17 times, 17 great grandparental generation for this gentleman. And if you do the math backwards to this stage of his family tree, there's 524,000 of them, 288. Compare it again to the population of France in 1500, modern France, 15 million people. Now we're getting to a number that, that gets an interesting. 524,000 is about 3% of the French populace. So this gentleman, going back just 500 years, has as his ancestors 3% of the po French population, in theory. What if you go back just another 100 years, AD 1400? So this is pre-age of discovery in Europe. We don't even have Columbus on the scene yet. We've got 21 great 
21 times great grandparents for his ancestors. And if you do the math, it's doubling, doubling, doubling. It's exponential growth. He has 8 million in theory. Well, in 1400, France has just recovered or is recovering from the Black Death, which decimated Europe. There's 11 million people in total. So this guy's ancestors represent over 70% of the population of France, in theory. Well, let's not stop there. Let's go back another 200 years, 1200. Middle Ages, think, think knights and castles and such. We're at the 29 times great grandparents for him. And in theory, there should be two billion of them. Not million, two billion of them. At this time, this is pre-Black Death. There's 10 and a half million people in France. There's 360 million people in the entire globe. So you might say, wait a minute, how can he have two billion ancestors? If there's only 360 million people total in the globe. So we've got 8 billion people total today. That, of course, is a massive increase from 1400. And you can see here in 1200, there's even fewer people, 360 million. These numbers don't hold true just for the Frenchmen. The same math applies to the Englishmen because the same biology applies to the Englishmen. We all have two parents who come from two parents and two parents and on back you go. So that in 1400, the Englishmen would have had 8 million ancestors in theory. The British Isles alone contained only 3.5 million people. So where did the rest come from? France. And of course, in AD 1200, he's got at, at the 29 times great grandparental generation, he's got 2 billion of them, which is greater than the population of the globe. So how do we make sense of this seeming contradiction, which is based on basic biology? You can't come from less than two parents. The math is straightforward. The biology is straightforward. Well, let's think about this graphically. Instead of just putting numbers on a page, let's try drawing the family tree. So instead of putting numbers here, we'll keep them on the, on the side of the screen just for reference. So there's one person here at this generation. He's the offspring of his two parents. So there's two branches on his family tree. His two parents then come from two more people. He's got four grandparents. Each grandparent comes from two parents. So eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents. This is our problem graphically. We can't have his family tree branching, 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 branching without end. Otherwise, you quickly exceed the number of total people on the planet. So how do you solve this problem? You can't come from less than two people. How do you stop this? Well, the way you solve this problem is by making the branches connect. So some of the branches on his mother's side connect to some of the branches on his father's side. So his parents are much more related. My parents are much more related. Your parents are much more related than any of us are probably comfortable with. And the reason this is the way it is is because it has to be. This is the way the math works out. And let's, let's compare it to something we might all be more familiar with. Many of our skeptics complain incessantly that we say Cain married his sister. That's ridiculous. How could he ever get his wife? There must have been more people alive on the planet. See evolution. And on and on the argument goes. They think it's, it's absurd that someone would marry their relative. But the scripture is clear, of course. The first man was Adam, 1 Corinthians 15. The first woman was Eve. Uh, Adam named his wife Eve because she's the mother of all living, not some of the living. Genesis 5 says Adam and Eve had more than Cain, Abel, and Seth. They had sons and daughters. And the prohibition against marrying close relatives doesn't come until Leviticus, which is the Mosaic law. And with modern biology in hand, we can easily understand why this, this prohibition is so light. And this is probably a review for many of our viewers who are familiar with our literature. If not, hopefully this will answer a, a long-standing question you may have had. Adam and Eve are created perfect, of course, perfect DNA. Shortly thereafter, they undergo the curse because of their sin. This starts the degeneration process. They eventually die. And of course, they, they copy their DNA. The next generation gets even worse because of mutations. Well, the institution of Leviticus 18 doesn't happen until about 2,500 years later when DNA mutations start to accumulate. And even modern, secular, totally a-Christian doctors and biologists will say the reason it's bad to marry close relatives is because of this mutational accumulation. 
That's often why when people do marry close relatives, they're either infertile or their children have medical problems. It's because they're passing on this, the effects of the curse, essentially. Well, people get all bent out of shape about this, but if they'd start to examine their own family tree, they'd realize it, the apple doesn't fall far from the, from the trunk either. We have to, in, in our recent past, have close relationships among our own parents. We're much more related to ourselves than we think. It may not be brother, sister, but there's a whole lot more connections and mixing up in the family tree than we think. Well, this is the Frenchman. What about the British guy? What about this rivalry and any other rivalry on the planet? Well, let's look back at this tree that I just drew. There's no reason I have to put him at that spot on the tree. Let's erase some of those branches. I could just as easily slide him over to the left he still comes from two parents, who come from two parents, and on and on we go. And then if we want to include the Brit in this diagram, we can slide him over to the right. And the same story holds true. You have to make some of the branches of that Englishman's tree connect. And so, so either... I, 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 I'm starting to get this. In other words, to explain the population today, uh, when, when you go back, you there has to be smaller populations but they were all mixing together so there's there's no way to escape this closer relatives were were marrying until you go back exactly. to of course Noah and his family and they were they were very close relatives and adam and eve their children of course they were the only people other than adam and eve so this this all makes sense in our modern world Yes, and we, we lack, I think, many people lack this comparative idea. They just have the sense that, of course, we're not related. Me and Ken can't possibly be related. Me and my spouse can't possibly be related. Just way back in the, the inscrutable history and the eons of time. And, and of course, then Cain and, Cain and marrying his sister, that's just icky. But no, it doesn't work that way. Even in our modern recent era, there's a lot more connections than many of us would probably be comfortable with. And I just want to remind people too, when you talk about Cain's wife and so on, the doctrine of a marriage based upon uh, the Bible in Genesis and Jesus in Matthew 19 and Mark 10, quoted from passages in Genesis to uh, talk about the doctrine of marriage, it's one man and one woman. And we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, we're all humans, and it's only humans that can marry. So you do marry your relative. It's just Today, you don't marry a close relative, but the further back you go, the closer your relative was. And of course, in biblical history, when we read about uh, Israel and, and some of the people uh, associated there, you realize they were close relatives. Exactly. So the only way the French and the British cannot be related is if somehow all the residents of the British Isles were cloistered and remained together and married only amongst one themselves for hundreds, thousands of years, and the same thing on the European mainland and the, and the French uh, section of it. But what's the chance of that occurring? What that would mean then is you have even more close relationships and more inbreeding, so to speak, among these people. And, and who would put up with that? And of course, this is just one example. Two European countries, it applies across the whole European mainland. The French is, are related to the, to the Germans. They're related to the Russians. And if we go beyond the European continent, Think about uh, close related lands. You've got Turkey here. You've got Africa just to the south. The, the Turkish family trees, the French family trees must be interconnected. Even the African must be connected. In 2004, there was a group of mainstream scientists who were doing some mathematical modeling with computers to, to look at how close related people must be. And they started off with some unrealistic assumptions just because this is a a computationally intense problem. If you're going to run a big computer program, you start simple and then to not use so much computing power, you add progressively complexity over time. They said, well, what if we treated the whole world as one intermixing group of people? Let's say there were no barriers to marriage. We, we erased this, the, the barriers of geographic distance. We erased the barriers of language differences, cultural differences. You could, in theory, marry anyone you wanted to. How long ago would the ancestor of everyone alive today have lived? And this is not me, this is, this is mainstream scientists. They calculated that common ancestor would live in AD 1180. Now, what this does not mean is that there was one person alive in AD 1180. It means in this sea of humanity, just under a thousand years ago, there was one person alive then, 
who could have had all of us, all eight billion of us, as his or her descendants, because these family trees intermix so quickly. And in fact, if you go back a few more hundred years, I think it's around the time of the Dark Ages in Europe, the peoples of the world fall into two groups. Either they're part of the group in which everyone in that group are the ancestors of everyone alive today, or they're the ancestors of no one. Well, how do you become the ancestors of no one? Maybe our viewers are, are part of families where they know someone who's infertile or they don't have kids, or maybe they've been lifelong bachelors or single their whole lives. That's what eventually leads to the extinction of a family line. So you have enough of these over a couple hundred years and that family line goes away and so that they aren't the, the ancestors of anyone alive. That's just the way the math works out. Now, the world of course is divided by language and geography and so forth. So ultimately the question of how closely related or separate we are has to be answered by that. But notice that there are no theoretical barriers to having an ancestor that recently, which implies then, that's just that's less than a thousand years ago, racial change can happen quickly. Not just in a, for, our, for our creationist viewers, it's not just post-Babel that racial change may have happened. In theory, this could have happened over and over and over again, even in recent history. Instead in question, of, of course, racial change, we could call it people group change or exactly. characteristics. Ethnic change. Yeah, ethnic change. Because people refer to it as racial change, but there's only one race. So um, it's what people refer to as racial change. But in actual fact, we're all one race, all closely related. Exactly. So those white supremacists who think they're part of this long line of white people and Caucasians, hold on. There might be some big surprises in your family tree. We'll discuss some of those later. In our next episode, we'll discuss how this could even be possible for races or ethnic groups to change this quickly. But for now, I just want our viewers to see that French are probably British. My wife is probably a close relative of me. Ken and I probably have a recent common ancestor. And this is just from taking a deep dive into the numbers on our family tree. I don't know who Ken's ancestors are. I can only trace mine back a few generations. Most of us can probably only go back a few. Even without that knowledge, the simple math of it, doubling, doubling, doubling means there's a whole lot more connections than we think. And of course, so, in, in our previous episode, we're looking at the world population size. So let me ask you a question here, just to, uh, in regard to this. So after the Tower of Babel, because God gave different languages and people moved away from each other according to their own family groups. So for a while, those family groups wouldn't have mixed together, would they? Most likely. It's a good question. I've been rethinking a lot of this. I've had this default assumption that, that people separated and remained separated. Then I've gone back and said, wait a minute, I think the text might even imply there was more mixing than I thought. You think I, I'm thinking of Genesis 12 and 13, just a few hundred years after Babel, Abraham's in Egypt, which is probably a different language group. Of course, then a, just a little while later, his, uh, his, his descendants, Jacob and his sons and such, are in Egypt for a couple hundred years, mixing with the Egyptians. A mixed multitude comes out from Egypt. They're, of course, eventually conquered by the, uh, the Babylonians. There's the Persians that come along, the Assyrians. I've had to say, hold on, you go from Babel, there's, there's all sorts of events, even in Israel's history, where people are mixing and probably between different language groups, different types of language. And if this happens in Israel's history, how much more so the rest of the world? And I've really had to rethink this. I've, for my own benefit, I've been thinking of creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, conquest as another C. We haven't even gotten to Christ yet because even in Israel's history, they're being conquered. They're being hauled off to one place. They're coming out of Egypt and, and a whole bunch of other people are coming with them, this mixed multitude. Uh, you think of the lineage of Christ, you've got uh, Rahab in that lineage, you've got uh, Ruth the Moabitess in this lineage. So I, I'm beginning to think this is probably the rule more than the exception. And genetics seems to be bearing this out. We'll, we'll get to that eventually, how mixed up we are really. And uh, it's, it's fairly easy to change the language. Another example I think of is a, a sad story. The African-Americans in the States, in, in South America as well, genetically, they look like they come from Africa. Linguistically, 
the languages of Africa are very different than English and Spanish and, and Portuguese, which are the primary languages here in the Americas now. We're in the Indo-European family. The African languages are either Niger Congo or there's there's click languages. Or whole, there's a whole other set of them. And what do you do? You you learn a new language in a sense when you come here. Or if if the reverse were to happen and someone were to conquer the United States and haul us off, you you have to survive in your in your new conquered. The, the land of the conquerors and, you, and to survive you got to learn their language so you don't lose your genetics but you you might lose some of your your cultural heritage and you have to survive just by learning a new language so this so seems after, to be the rule through history so after the tower of babel they would have definitely split into different groups for language but then it wouldn't take long and they were learning their other languages and mixing back together again and so on as they moved out around the earth and what's, what strikes me about even what leads up to the Tower of Babel, if you, if you look at the ages of the patriarchs, Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, they're alive when this happens, most likely. Some of them are overlapping with the life of Abraham, which is really sad. Noah being a godly man, man of faith, and under his watch, they're building a tower to reach the heavens. The rebelling against man, the depravity of man is on full display. Well, if it happens that fast in the presence of a man that Hebrews 11 calls out for his godliness, how much more so is it going to repeat itself once they split? What are we going to do? Well, let's fight. Let's rebel again. That's sadly, I think, is, has been the story of human history. Conquest, pillage, rape, slaughter, so forth, because the depravity of man hasn't disappeared. So the world is much smaller than we think. The world is much smaller than we think. We're much more connected than we think. And there's a whole lot more to come. Uh, racial or ethnic change can happen much more quickly than we think. And all this throws into new light the identity of the ancients and their relationship to us. Much more to come in, in subsequent episodes. So when we do part three and part four, and that'll be next week, we trust, we'll do part three and part four. And we'll continue on for there for 6,000 years of history. No, we, we can't do it in 6,000 years. Uh, but just to give people just a little inkling, you know, just in a few seconds, basically. But now when you've studied genetics, I mean, there have been major events in the past of wars and, you know, plagues and all sorts of events. Does your genetics show any of that or your study of genetics? I've numerous times encountered situations where I see a, a, a branch of the human family tree. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. And eventually it does, as I dig deeper into history, I'm basically having to get the equivalent of a bachelor's degree in history. What's crazy about genetics is it lets nothing go to the side. Unless a people group goes completely extinct, every single event is there in great detail. And it's almost overwhelming how much detail is there. And uh, in, in the next few episodes, we'll talk about how quickly ethnic change can happen. And, and thereafter, we'll talk about how to, how to silently take over a country talking about the math of reproductive rates, how you can, how all of Europe could in theory be the descendants of African people in the recent past. It's these sorts of things that can happen quickly. And, and ultimately what dictates it is what happens in history. And we'll, we'll go through example after example of, wow, there it is, this conquest of the Mongols. And then the Russian push after the Mongols back East. And then the descendants of those people into India and over and over again, you name almost any historical event and it seems to show up. And what's really limiting right now is, uh, you may not see everything right now, is because we only have a few thousand people with DNA sequences. And as we get more and more DNA sequences, it will all be there. That's, that's what's so remarkable about this. And from an apologetic perspective, it's gonna be very difficult for the evolutionary community to refute. What can you say if you say, look, there's the Mongol conquest, the Roman empire, the Greek empire, there it is. You can't see it any other way. And, and really the only way to see it is through the biblical lens of 6,000 years. In this story, 6,000 years is the hero of the plot. And this, this is an aspect of biology that is unique. It's, it's modern and it makes the division between old earth creation and young earth creation all that more stark and, and interesting going forward. Wow, this is gonna be fascinating. I can't wait for part three and part four uh, next week. So thank you, Dr. Jensen. And you are a PhD in biology from Harvard University, working with Answers in Genesis in our research department. And if people go to answersingenesis.org, uh, 
they can find some of the articles online that you have written previously and also in our answers research journal which is our online technical journal that's free uh, peer-reviewed journal for people to go to so answersingenesis.org and come back again for part four and part five uh, next weekend